my kids who were big Office fans. Michael Scott and Office. We haven't watched it the last year or two as much because Michael Scott's not there anymore. But he went and spoke to a business school, if you remember. So I want to show you a clip of that. <clears throat> okay, so let's see. Which one was it? This is just to add to a little humor. And I'd like to start today by inspiring you. May I borrow someone's textbook, please? Thank you. What have we here? Ooh, economics. Very, very interesting. You cannot learn from books. Replace these pages with life lessons, and then you will have a book that is worth its weight in gold. <laughs> I know these are expensive, um, but the lesson is priceless. <laughs> All right, I think you're inspired. Shall we proceed? There are four kinds of business. Tourism, food service, railroads, and sales, and hospitals slash manufacturing. Okay, and we like Michael Scott and he's very funny, etc. But when he made that comment about life lessons, um, that's kind of what Brother Tanner asked me to come and do is talk to you a little bit about my career and maybe share with you some of the lessons that I've learned in my years of, uh, in financial services. Um, I graduated from BYU a long time ago, 1977, about 35 years ago. And I'm going to share with you a couple of things that happened along the way. And in doing so, I got permission from um, Brother Tanner that I could also share with you some of the things that um, I feel is very important that you need to learn. Now this is a church institution, a church school, so I'm going to throw in a couple of things because I don't think you can become successful financially if you don't have a spiritual side in that quest, okay? President Hinckley said this a number of years ago, these aren't necessarily in order of priority, but he said each of us have a fourfold responsibility. We have the responsibility to our families, responsibility to our um, uh, employers, responsibility to do the Lord's work, and then we have a responsibility to ourselves. And you guys, why that is so important is because you're going to get degrees and you're going to figure out what you want to do with your life and you're going to start to have families, etc. And while you're worried about your work and worried about making money, things happen along the way, okay? Things like this, okay? So all the years that I was trying to make a living, my family kept getting bigger and bigger, okay? Which put more and more pressure on me. This picture was taken a couple of years ago at one of my son's uh, wedding. And the point I'm trying to make is that you balance what you're doing professionally, but then you've got this family that you've got to make sure you're spending enough time with. And then we also have the church which, you know, we have callings and things like that that go on in the church. So this balance is so important. Even though right now you're focused on getting an education to pursue a career, there's other aspects of life that are very important. There was a couple of, there's a few years in my life that I spent two or three weeks out of the month in New York, away from my family. And I had these little kids that were growing up. And it was difficult because even though I have a wonderful wife and she did all the work at home, etc., I was gone a lot, and it got to a point where I thought I was gone too much, and I went into a different area, and I'll talk about that in a second. But the point I want to make here is there's got to be balance, because this stuff, this is just going to happen to you, okay? We had eight kids. Um, they now are married, a lot of them, most of them, six out of the eight. One's on a mission in Spain. The daughter on the far left, she's on a mission in Spain. And then I have a son right here that's a senior in high school. <clears throat> And so you have to remember that as important as the education is and the, the pursuit of a career, you have to balance yourself, okay? <clears throat> I'm going to share with you just for a few minutes my career. And the reason I want to do that is because as I talk about some of the things that I did, then I can share with you some of the lessons that I learned. 
And then I'm going to get into some traits that I think will be good for you to maybe think about as you pursue what you're going to do. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about startups, about small businesses, because maybe some of you guys have ideas. This great idea concept, I'm going to share with you something that actually happened in my family with a son who actually presented a business plan to an angel investor, a wealthy guy that was giving money to students at BYU to pursue their dreams. And then I'm going to close with some other comments, final comments, okay? Like I said, I graduated in 1977 in accounting, okay? So that's another thought right there. You might be getting a degree in some area, and you might not end up working in that area. At the time that I got my degree in accounting, I thought I was going to go work for one of the big eight firms. At that time, there was eight, now there's four. Okay, one of the big eight firms, that's what I thought I was going to do. But there was a company up in the state of Washington that I, I knew something about. And um, I kind of thought that that would be a great place for me to work. And so I went up there and I interviewed with them. But they told me there was a freeze on hiring. There was a freeze, they weren't hiring anybody, so you know, you should look elsewhere. And I interviewed at a couple other places, but this is the place I wanted to work. And my wife and I, we prayed about it, felt good about it. We moved up to, back up to Washington where we're from. And within a month, these people called me and said, we've got a spot for you. Okay, now you might think that's a coincidence. I think it was an answer to prayer. And we actually, you know, I started working for this place called the Washington Public Power Supply System. What they did back in the 70s and early 80s is they built nuclear power plants. You build a nuclear power plant to generate electricity for the people that live up in that area. The reason they had to go with nuclear is because they didn't have coal and they'd already dammed the Columbia River and the big rivers up there, the Snake River, more than they possibly could imagine. That's another way you generate electricity is through dams. And so they were building these nuclear power plants. And out in Washington, in the southeastern part of Washington, is a desert, 60 miles in every direction, and it's owned by the government. And they thought this would be a good place where they could build these nuclear power plants. Well, what I did with Washington Public Power Supply System, I got involved in their finance program because to build these projects, it cost between eight and ten billion dollars. And that was exciting to me. That's what I wanted to do. That's what I went to school for, is I wanted to get involved in these financing projects. And so that's where I started. And it was a tremendous experience. And I was sent back to New York. I was involved. I wasn't that smart. I was just a kid out of college. But I'll tell you what happened to me. Back in those days, if you knew how to run a Texas Instrument or a Hewlett Packard calculator, and you graduated from a university and you went to work with these older guys that didn't know anything about calculators, they thought you were pretty smart. And I can remember that I would go into these meetings and we would do this financial analysis with these projects and they would say, get the, get the college kid, Denny. Figure out the numbers on your thing there. And, and I'd sit there and I'd do all these present value and all these you know, calculations on my calculator. I wasn't that smart, but I knew how to run a calculator, just like you guys know how to run these computers, which I didn't do when I was your age, okay? But because I got involved with this, uh, these people in, these, in this financing program, I started to develop a reputation that I was kind of the smart guy. And believe me, I wasn't, okay? But I knew how to talk, I knew how to you know, come across, and I knew how to do these financial analyses, and they liked it. The people in the upper offices, they liked it. They wanted me in their meetings. So I was fortunate to start off that way. And then eventually, because I really wanted to get into the investment world, because that was something that was fascinating to me, I had a good relationship with the guy that was over investments and I made an inner kind of company transfer. I went out of the finance group into the investment group. And that's really where I started my career and something that I wanted to do. I wanted to know why Wall Street did what Wall Street does. I wanted to know why the markets go up. I wanted to know why the markets go down. I wanted to learn all that I could. And so I surrounded myself with very smart people. And there on a daily basis, we had about two and a half billion dollars that we were managing. And on a daily basis, we would sit there and buy and sell and make you know, investment decisions, et cetera. And I was locked in this trading room with these people up there in Washington. And we were making these decisions. And I was sitting there watching them and learning how to do it. And one guy in particular became my mentor and trained me and taught me a lot of stuff that I needed to know. And he sent me back to New York, where I spent a week several times with Merrill Lynch and you know, these, these big firms, Goldman Sachs, et cetera, Smith Barney. <coughs> And I sat there on their trading desks, and because we were the client, I learned a lot. When you're with the client, and these people want to cater to the client, okay, the client has a lot of privileges. 
because I can say and do and act and ask the questions and do the things I want because they want to make the client happy. We had two and a half billion dollars to manage and so they wanted that business. And so I had a great, res you know, a great relationship developing. After a few years of doing that, because I was kind of the Mormon guy, there was a big project that was going to be built in southern Utah called the Intermountain Power Project. It's down by Delta, Utah. And instead of nuclear power plants, these people were going to build these big coal fire plants because they have the coal in southern Utah. And they were going to build these big coal fire plants and they were going to generate electricity. And we built an 1,100 mile transmission line that went from southern Utah to southern California. And all the big California cities, including Los Angeles, purchased that power from us. Okay, so that was this big project, and this project was going to cost about $10 billion. And so there again, I was now involved in a bigger company, in, in a startup company kind of, in a way. I was the seventh guy there hired, and we were going to finance this big project through issuing municipal bonds. And so the thing that I did the next few years working for these people was I would go out on these dog and pony shows, which is when you go out to these potential investors, and you tell them about your project because you want them to invest in the project. And then you issue these bonds, you get the money, and the money goes to pay for the cost of construction of building the project. Well, not only was I involved in that financing program, but I also took the money that we got and I invested it. So I was the money, the money guy at this place called the Intermountain Power Agency. And so here I was for the first maybe eight or nine years of my career managing corporate money. At IPA, we had two and a half billion dollars. And in a six year period that I was there, I made over a billion dollars in interest and capital gains. So that billion dollars that I made by turning the portfolio over and managing it the way that it should be managed, I was able to generate about a billion extra dollars, which went back to pay for this project. And so I developed another reputation that this guy in Salt Lake City was making a lot of money. And I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of the lessons that I learned in that process. So here I am, these first two areas, managing corporate money. Well, because of my relationships with New York that we're developing, I had offers from the Goldman Sachs and the Merrill Lynch's and the first Boston's of the world to come and work for them. But there are now sudden, I'm going to be taking a big risk. Because up here, when you work for a corporation, you're paid a salary, you're fairly secure with your job. Now all of a sudden I'm going to become a salesman, a commission salesman. And if I don't do the business, then I don't get paid. And so there was an extreme amount of risk that I was now taking with this family to move to California, okay? From Washington to Utah and now to California. Pretty risky just to move to California in general for us, okay? That was kind of a scary thing for us. And, um, but I felt good about it. We prayed about it. We felt the decision was good, and so we packed up the kids and we moved to California. And there I was, you know, at first Boston, I was given a list of clients, and they said, now go do business with these people. And so I had to sell myself. I had to figure out a way that I was going to get these people to get to know me and to do business with me. And so that's what happened. First Boston, I was there for five years. These guys wanted the clients that I had there. They knew that they could get me then I, my clients would come with me. So then I went to Lehman for a while. Same thing with Bear Stearns. They wanted something they didn't have and they knew I had it, so I went to Bear Stearns. Okay, that's how you move up and that's how you move around. And the thing that's interesting about Wall Street, what do you think their most important product is? The most important product in a Wall Street firm walks out the door every night. Okay? Because Wall Street can't function without their bankers, without their sales force, without their traders, the people that are making the money, the relationships that are building, okay, these are the individuals that walk out the door every night and that's the most important product in the financial services industry. Because if they want to get rid of me because of something I'm doing here, that's fine. But they are taking the risk of losing relationships that I have, okay, and they know that. <coughs> and so that's why they treat their employees well, that's why you hear about these big salaries is because these kinds of people can generate a lot of revenue for these firms. Now I was in the trading side of it, the fixed income side of it. So what I had to do is my clients now were professional money managers. Whereas up here I was managing corporate money, now I'm going to help these professional money managers manage their portfolios. So the big mutual funds, the banks, the pension funds, you know, these were my hedge funds, these were my clients. The, the LDS Church was my client for 15 years. The LDS Church had a lot of money, right? You guys know that. 
And that money just doesn't sit in the bank, that money has to be earning. And so there's things that the LDS Church now does, and they need people like me at the time to go and get these kinds of products for them, okay? So I did this for a number of years, and then I had to get up at 3.40 a.m. every morning. Had to be at my desk in San Francisco at 10 to 5. And you do that for 15, 16, 17 years, you, you get tired, okay? And I had my kids, I was coaching their basketball and their sports, and they called me to be a bishop for six years, and I was in bishoprics. And so this balance that I talked about at the beginning is going on in my life while I'm trying to be, you know, a success financially, okay? But I just kind of got tired, and it hit me when my daughter got married and my son went on a mission, my first oldest son. And I thought, have I missed out? They're gone now. And it was kind of sad to me. It was gone, it, it was sad because now they were starting to leave my family. And, I, and once, as you're a parent, they start to leave on missions, which you want them to do, or they go off and get married, which you want them to do, but they're kind of gone. Yeah, they come back, and you see them all the time, but now they're kind of away from the family. And it made me think, you know, because these three now were kind of on their way out, I had five left at home. I decided I wasn't going to do this anymore because I was, I was tired of the competitive, risk-taking nature of Wall Street. And I said, I want to do something that I kind of always wanted to do anyway from the very beginning. And that was now to manage individual money. So I went from corporate money to helping other people manage their money professionally. Now I manage in individual, wealthy individuals. Brother Tanner's one of them, okay? Where we sit and we talk about what they can do, <laughs> what we can do to help maximize their return, to protect the value of their assets, and so I'm a certified a, a financial advisor registered with the SEC, and that's what I do now for a living. We started with 20 or 30 million, we have about 250 now, so I just have another partner and another lady that works with it, there's three of us. But at the very beginning, that was another risk that I was taking. I was going, getting away from a lot of money that I was making here, now to making not much at all, until I started to build up the assets. Okay, but I felt more comfortable with this because my lifestyle is different now. I can kind of do my own thing, and I, because of the internet and technology, I can, I can see what the market's doing at 10 o'clock at night when I call Tokyo, or I can see what's happening in London at one or two in the morning if I want to. Or I can sit here at home when the market opens up in California. And so because of the internet, I can make trades and do things even at home. Even though I go into work every day, I'm always in touch. And of course, with the iPhones and the technology, I can tell you what Apple's doing right now. You know, that's the instantaneous of what that's all about, okay? So is there any questions about this before I move? This was kind of my 35 years wrapped up in these, in these three areas. Managing corporate money, managing other people who manage professional money, hedge funds, etc., to individual money. And this is what I'm doing now. Any questions about any of this? Yes, sir. What are your official uh, certifications that you hold? Well, I was registered. If you were to become a financial advisor today, you'd want to be, become a certified financial planner or, you know, CPAs sometimes end up becoming financial advisors. Because of my extensive re um, time experience in Wall Street, I didn't think going and taking a test and getting a few initials after my name mattered at that time. And it really hasn't to my clients because they look at my background, they sit down with me, they know what I'm doing. And, and um, I'm not saying that the new people don't know what they're doing, they certainly do. But you can't ever, just like Michael Scott says, you can't ever learn in a textbook or in taking a test and getting those initials. You know, I have Series 7, Series 63, I've taken all those tests and I'm registered with the SEC. But um, you learn what life is about through your experience. And because I had such an extensive uh, background with Wall Street and the finance world, etc., you know, I see people on CNBC every day that were my clients at one time or that I had dealings with them, good and bad. Um, I see people that have been hauled away to jail that I've sat in their offices over the years. Um, John Corzine is one of them. He was governor of New Jersey. He was president of Goldman Sachs. And I've been in his office. I've had dinner with him and sat there with him. And now to see him in the limelight where, you know, this MFS global thing and they lost a lot of money and, you know, who knows what's going to happen to him. But I see these people all the time. So that's kind of what I did as a career, okay? Any other questions? Now what I want to do is, um, 
because really you guys, what you're going to end up doing, some of you are going to go work for a company, smaller company, maybe a corporation, or maybe you're going to start your own business, but think about it. What you're going to do in the next 10, 15 years of your lives is you're going to sell yourself. Okay? Now you can go work for a company, you can be very good at what you're doing, and they like you, and you're going to keep getting that salary. Okay? But if you start a business, which we're going to talk about in a second, you're going to sell your business, but you've got to sell yourself. Okay, isn't that what missionaries do? My boys went on missions, and they were very good missionaries. They developed these skills to come across with people, to share the gospel with, and that's really what I'm going to talk a little bit about, is because I really was selling myself. The first place that I worked, we were managing money, but why would the next place hire me if they didn't think I could do it? And then when I got done there, I went to the Wall Street firms. Why would they hire me if they thought I was going to fail? I had to, I had to be a pretty good salesman. And it's not that I'm saying something here that's shady or dishonest, okay? It's okay to be a good salesman. That's what you want to be. You're not trying to fake anybody out or try to be somebody that you're not. What you're doing is you've, you've developed some traits of becoming a good salesman, okay? <clears throat> The first one, I'm going to just mention a few, and, and this list could be, you could have your own list even. You've got to be determined, you're diligent, you've got to know your product, and the answer is any questions that may come. So when I was a salesman trying to get a hedge fund manager or a big bank to do business with me and my firm, then I had to come across with knowledge, and I had to be determined, I had to be diligent, knowing everything about him, what he was looking for, and what my firm could offer to help him in that endeavor, okay? So one of the first traits of a good salesman, you have to be diligent, you have to be determined, okay? This one you have to be creative because you guys, you can't just become a salesman of, say you're a pharmaceutical rep and you just show up with a business card and a pamphlet, okay? That might work for some people, but there's something that's gotta happen between that doctor and that pharmaceutical rep that makes that doctor want to buy those products or use those products, okay? There's the knowledge, there's the personality, there's something that's got to be shared there. And that person has to be creative. When I was managing all this money, okay, say you've got $2 billion, which I was managing. Everybody on Wall Street wanted to do business with me because as a commission salesman, you do business with this guy, you're going to get paid. But think of it sitting in my chair. I got $2 billion to manage and I got 40 primary dealers out there. I can't have 40 people calling me all the time. So I settled in on six or eight or 10 salesmen, and when other people would call, I would say, you know what, my coverage is full right now. Maybe something can happen down the road, but I don't really need you know, to talk to you. I've got, I've got what I need here, okay? And people would call me all the time, and I'd say, sorry, I'm full up. I, can't, I just can't take any more you know, sales coverage, okay? But one time, one guy, okay, answered the phone, Eight seconds to go in the game. Notre Dame 50, BYU 49. Okay? And he went through this next 30 seconds, step by step by step, of a game that I'm going to show you, where BYU beat Notre Dame in 1981 to move to the final eight in the NCAA basketball tournament. And as this guy was sharing with me step by step by step, I just started to get a smile on my face, A, because he knew I was a BYU graduate, and, and B, that uh, he knew I liked basketball, and he knew that if he would have called me and said, hey, this is so-and-so from so-and-so, you know, I'd like to start calling on you and see if we could do some business, I'd probably say, no, nah, you know, I've got enough guys. I don't need anybody new. But he started off with this Danny Ainge last eight seconds thing, okay? And this is what, this is what happened, if I can just do this real quick. <clears throat> Let's see, how do I do it, Brett? What? Oh, just hit it? Okay. And this hit player? Yeah. And knocked the back of the ball again. Notre Dame's defense slides down to the opposite end of the floor, and there are eight seconds to go. Okay. Ainge against Paxson. Five seconds. Inside. Ainge scores for two seconds. So now, you guys might not think that's a big deal, but... Uh, it was a big deal to me, okay? I was there for that game. That <laughs> you were there? Big deal. BYU made it to the final eight. They beat Notre Dame. I mean, Kelly Terpuka, Orlando, Woolridge, I mean, some of us that are older remember that. It's like you guys know the Jimmer Fredette era, okay? But this Danny Ainge thing, and so here's this guy on the end of the phone 
reliving this memory with me. And I says, who is this? And he told me, and we laughed, and I said, tell you what, that was pretty creative. He said, if you want to call on me, go ahead. We'll see if something can work out, and we'll start doing business together. That's just an example. I've never forgot that. Here's a salesman that tried to get to do business with me, and he did it through something like that, okay? The next thing is be confident, okay, you guys? Not only was Danny Ainge confident, look what Jimmer Fredette did. I was at the Jimmer Fredette game three years ago where he scored 52 points against New Mexico. I was there in Las Vegas watching that game, watching three guys try to guard this guy, maybe even a fourth, and he still gets 52 points. When he walked on the court, Jimmer Fredette had so much confidence, it was unbelievable. And it rubbed off on everybody around him, okay? But if you're going to be a good salesman, you want to be confident in what you're selling, okay? And be comfortable with people. The more you become confident and you teach yourself how to do that, okay, the more you'll be a better salesman, okay? It's just as simple as that. <clears throat> the next thing, just real quick, integrity, and I know you've heard a lot about this, but you guys don't ever compromise your standards. Okay, I had situations in my life, especially in Wall Street, where they wanted me to do something and encouraged me to do something that went against what I believed in. I actually had firms when I was in my upper 20s and back in New York that would assign me an escort because we'd go to dinners, we'd go to parties, whatever they wanted me to do at night. I was the client. They felt that I was too shy to say, no, 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 I don't want to do that. But, but they, they would actually almost force me to have a companion. I said, I'm married. I have no interest in doing this. And I, I would get mad. I said, you guys, just leave me alone, okay? But firms are like that. Whether it's Wall Street, whether it's the big firm, the law firms of the world, the CPA firms of the world, the drug firms of the world, there's things like this that are going on, but you can't ever compromise. I had people tell me once in a group of people that said, Denny, nobody will ever trust you if you don't drink with them, okay? And you guys will get that someday, okay? I've never drank. And there's plenty of people that trust me. But there's a lot of people that feel in this world, if you can't go have a beer with somebody after work, they're not going to learn to trust you. Now, I went and had beer with them. I just drank Diet Coke or whatever. They had the beer. So I did that. But I never compromised who I was or my standards. Integrity, and you don't ever want to get caught in a lie or being dishonest, okay? You, that'll just kill your salesmanship forever if people figure out that they can't trust you, okay? Um, you can't give up, okay, you're going to have rejection. As missionaries we have rejection, don't we? Does that mean we don't go out the next day? No. As salesmen, you're going to have rejection, but you can't give up, okay? You have to keep plaguing away, and it takes courage to keep going. As a commissioned salesman, there would be months where I didn't do much business, and I could see that I wasn't going to get paid much. But I had to have the faith to know that if I kept pursuing and kept plugging away, the next month would be a better month. That's what happens in sales all the time. Okay, we're a service-oriented economy. And a lot of you guys are going to end up selling in some way or another, okay? <clears throat> close the deal. I throw this up there because if you can't learn to close the deal, then you're not going to be that successful. Okay, so you want to be able to, to make sure that if the client is close to what you guys kind of want to do, you can't let time click by too quickly. You've got to be able to close the deal. Some people are better at that than others. Okay, that's an art, but you have to learn to close it. I would sit there in competition with Merrill Lynch, say uh, Goldman Sachs and Solomon Brothers. And here I was at First Boston. Okay, why would he do business with me versus these other three guys trying to get the same business done? Okay, there's some skill involved there and you had to get, you had to be able to close that deal. If you wait, sometimes he'll go to the other guy. This is what I'm trying to say there. And then finally here, follow through. If you tell your client you're going to do something, a good salesman is always going to make sure he follows through with that client. Okay? And that's how you build this relationship of trust. And that's how you continue to do sales on and on. You don't ever want to be a salesman that says, okay, I had a great January and I burned a few bridges. Okay? That doesn't make sense, does it? You want to have a good January, but that January has to be building. Okay, if it doesn't build, then it's going to go the other way. Now I want to talk, kind of shift gears here just really quick, because I, I know I only have a few minutes. If you Google this, these are some of the best startups in the 20th century. You recognize the names. I thought that was kind of interesting, okay? And of course these last four, the, the world of technology has taken off. <clears throat> Why were they successful? 
sound business model, sound revenue model, charged appropriately, budgeted for marketing. This is what you get, kind of your standard answers. But what's interesting about this are these first two. Facebook came to market in May at a $38 to $42 price. They went public as a, as a company. Their there's stock today trades at $18, $19, $20. Okay? And the reason is, is because even though they thought they had a sound business model or a sound revenue, how does Facebook make money? Facebook makes money by advertisement because you guys get on it for free. Well, now that we're all using our little handy-dandy you know, iPhones and Androids, there's not a whole lot of room on that little space for advertising. And so that's something that Wall Street couldn't quite figure out, that all of a sudden now, Facebook has a little bit of a revenue problem, okay? They're still going to eventually be a great company, but it's going to take a while for that stock price to go back up. Because they're successful, I mean, when they came to market, they were valued at $90 billion. Okay, that market cap now is cut in half. So it's still going to be a great company down the road. But I'm saying that they, they were successful even though it doesn't look like they did too well in those first two areas, okay? One thing I want to talk quickly about, too, is this guy. Just an unbelievable person, but you can learn a lot from Steve Jobs and Apple. In 1977 or 76, when he started Apple, he co-founded it with a guy, okay, out of this garage. They made a decent amount of money, but for the next 10 years, they kind of, they had a cute little computer, but it wasn't like the Dells, the IBMs, the Hewlett Packards, okay, because Microsoft was putting all their software on these other PC computers. Apple was out there kind of doing their own little thing. Well, after about 10 years, because of sluggish sales, they got rid of Steve Jobs. I don't know if you guys know that, okay? In 1985 or 86, um, Steve Jobs left the company. He sold all of his stock, and with his money, by the way, he, he became a multimillionaire. So, uh, you know, we don't feel sorry for Steve Jobs the first time. He created a new company called Next Computer, which was building this bigger, bigger computer that cost about $9,000, and there again, he was doing something that was a kind of against the norm, okay? In the middle of starting this other company, Next Computer was the name of it, N-E-X-T, he also had this company called Pixar. And with Pixar, it became a billion dollar company, you know, it started Toy Story and just took off this animation thing. So here's a guy that's created, you know, multi, hundreds of millions, billion dollar company, Apple. He goes to Next, creates a big company there, and Pixar, which becomes a billion dollar company. And then, because of Apple's sluggishness, they got Steve Jobs to come back in 1997 to head up Apple once again, okay? And uh, he sold Next Computer for $400 million. And of course, now we see what's happened with Apple. He said he wanted to start to get a computer in the hands of everyday people, and we succeeded beyond our wildest dreams. And when he came back in 1997, this was his motto, to think differently. Listen to a quote from Steve Jobs. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them, but the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. And those are the kinds of people Steve Jobs wanted. Okay? Mark Zuckerberg was considered a computer geek, not very popular, and he's worth, you know, fifteen billion dollars because he did this Facebook thing. Okay, he would be considered one of the crazy ones, one of the, the computer genius guys. Okay, but he knew what his vision was, and he knew how to get that company going forward, and he became extremely successful. <clears throat> there are lots of startups, you guys, and some of you might be thinking with this great idea program that's coming up. I just wrote this down in just a few minutes off the top of my head. You know about Twitter, Instagram, Pandora, Zynga? They're all free. Pandora, Instagram was purchased for a billion dollars and they don't even have that kind of revenue that they generate. But because the idea and the vision that people have going forward, I love Instagram. Do you guys know what Instagram is? Your little iPhones? I mean, I love it. 
you guys know what Twitter is, Pandora, the radio, Zynga, the games. These are guys that had these ideas and they've created very successful companies and have created a lot of wealth because of them. I have a son, Chad, that started a company as a student at BYU. There was this angel investor, this very wealthy guy that had this program and he had like 25 kids in this program. They had to meet with him every week for eight weeks. And during that eight week period, these kids were going to present to him their business idea. And if they were one of five, he was going to give each of these five $50,000 to pursue that business. Okay? My son happened to be one of them and he was chosen as one of the five. And he started a company called Weight Loss Wars. And he got his idea from this. There was eight of us in my ward in California that we were all overweight. And we thought, we got to do something to get us back into better shape and let's, let's have this big contest to see who can lose the most weight. And, you know, if, you, if I'm up against a 280 pound guy that's six foot five, he can lose 50 pounds easier than I can lose, you know, whatever. So the contest says who can lose the most weight in eight weeks and the percentage body, okay? Two categories. We all put $200 in a pot, $1,600 in this pot. After eight weeks, I won. I won the most weight, I lost 35 pounds, and percentage body weight, I beat out the rest of these guys. Chad was so inspired, he says, you know, we should do this on a, on a social networking idea. I should create a company where people can have weight loss competitions from somebody that doesn't even live by them. And so he created, on, on the computer, on a website, this way where for $10 you can join his website and he would keep track of the graphs and the lost weight and the chats you're having. So he was doing this way before the social networking that we're seeing now. But Chad didn't have a lot of money. He got the 50000 from this one guy, this one angel investor. But he created a pretty good company while he was still in school. And then he went on to Eat Health Compete, which now is corporations having weight loss competitions within the corporation. So there was, you know, like a big company with 100 employees and they had this kind of thing going on. Chad has sold these businesses and he's moved on to something else, but he did something that he had these ideas and he became very successful and he learned a lot by doing it. Um, he's working now for another company that was just purchased by the Japanese, so he's, he's going up the ladder that way. This guy, okay, I won't tell you who he is, you might recognize the name. He worked at Goldman Sachs with Brother Tanner's son and my son. And he quit Goldman Sachs because he wanted to build trampolines in Southern, er, in the Salt Lake Valley, Utah Valley. So he created a company called Airborne. And all it is, if you walk into this big warehouse, it's tons of trampolines all connected all over the place. And the first year, he made a ton of money. Okay? He's made so much money that he asked Brother Tanner's son and my son also to quit Goldman Sachs and join him with f future endeavors. They haven't done that yet. They thought about it. They looked at land and things like that. This is just an idea, guys. A guy had an idea to build this big old trampoline area. I don't know if you guys have been to those, but they're fun, okay? You guys know what J-Dogs is if you've been in Provo. A guy had a hot dog stand and a grandma with a special sauce. So he had this shack out there south of the Wilkinson Center and he just sold hot dogs with grandma's special sauce. Well, J-Dogs is unbelievably <clears throat> popular to where now he's got another bigger hot dog area out by the Ora Mall. And you think about In-N-Out in California, or Five Guys, I mean these are people with ideas. In-N-Out is incredible. Hamburgers, french fries, and milkshakes, that's all you get. And there's lines, and it's just an incredible franchise. But he won't go public, because he wants control of his company. My brothers were CPAs, and they have their own CPA firm. <clears throat> that might happen to you guys. If you become a lawyer, you might eventually want to start your own firm. That's what I did. I wanted to become a financial advisor, and so we started this firm, and that's what we do now. This one I love. This lady that I know had kids and wanted to, as they started to grow up, they were going to go on missions, uh, get married, go to college, but she was a stay-at-home mom. And she thought and thought and thought, what can I do to make money as a stay-at-home mom? So she looked into this and did the research. She went and spent, I don't know, three or $4,000 on chocolate fountains and started to market this company, okay? And this company would do chocolate fountains at weddings, bar mitzvahs, birthday parties, graduations, you name it. And she was making a decent amount of money that would pay for missions and tuition and weddings as a stay-at-home mom. And the years that she's been doing this, it might be, I don't know, six or eight years, she's probably made over thirty, forty thousand dollars 
that's enough to send somebody on a mission and to get somebody married and to you know, do a few other things. And the thing that's interesting is uh, she told me that uh, seven years ago, I think it was, she was asked to do her chocolate fountain for a Christmas party with this up-and-coming company. And she went and did this, and everybody there was like 19, 20, 21 years old. They were all young. She goes, there wasn't a grown-up, you know, older guy in the whole, you know, party. And there was probably 30 or 40 or 50 people in this. And she had her chocolate fountain, so she would just observe what they were talking about. And during the night, they all talked about how they were going to be millionaires with this company. And she couldn't understand it. And uh, anyway, guess what the company was? It was Facebook. Facebook had a Christmas party in 2005, and they asked her to come and put up the chocolate fountain. All 19, 20, 21, 22-year-olds talking about becoming millionaires. Well, guess what? They are. <laughs> OK? But it's interesting that she's done chocolate fountains at other places like Facebook. Just people that will go on the internet and says, we need a chocolate fountain, can we use your services? Anyway, those are some of the things you guys that uh, you can do, okay? Now, I've only got a couple minutes left, so let me just put these up here fast. You need a clear plan if you're going to start your own business, okay? It's got to be written out, okay? You need to know every aspect of your business, okay? You've got to know exactly how you're projecting your sales, your earnings, your expenses, because you don't want to get something started with your money and then find out six months down the road, oh, I didn't think of that. That was my demise. I just didn't think of that, okay? Know your business and its space. You need to know who your competitors are. You need to know if you're going to be a hot dog stand person. You've got to know what J-Dogs is doing to be a good hot dog stand. You need to know everything about your competition. And then finally, you need to pick a business you love because this is what you're going to do 24-7. If you want to start your own business, it's going to be a part of your life constantly. You lay awake at night because of your business, okay? And you want something that you're going to love. It's going to take all your money and all your time, but you can grow your business, you guys. There are so many things out there at your age that you can do, okay? The, you know, limitless as to what you think you can do and what you can eventually do. And some of you someday will have your own business, okay? <clears throat> now, in closing, I just want to end with two things before we do questions, if there are any. Elder Tingey said this, I've associated with thousands of college students. I can also say that what you decide to do with respect to your education, employment, preparation for marriage and church activity this time of your life will set the pattern for your future. If you will put the things of God first, you will make good decisions. It is so easy to make a decision that seems attractive at the time but in the aggregate, it will lead you away from the kingdom of God. Nothing else in eternity counts if you do not qualify today to return to Heavenly Father and His Son. So whatever you do, you guys, and decide to do professionally. <coughs> Remember at the first slide, your family, your church, your God, yourself. Those are things that are important. You've got to have balance, okay? And if I were to leave you with one closing thought, and if somebody asked you two months from now, what would that financial advisor guy talk about? I don't know. This is what I want you to remember from this 45 minutes today. Whatever you decide to do in life, you've got to include the Lord. He wants to be a part of your life, okay? Don't do anything of a major decision without praying first. These promptings are real. I have felt them in my life. When we packed up our kids to move to California, that was a serious move for me because we were stable and secure in Utah, okay? But we felt the promptings to go there, and it's worked out. The greatest lesson that I have learned in my life, Michael Scott says you can't learn from books, okay? The greatest lesson that I have learned is that include the Lord in everything that you do. And if you do that, you guys, I know that you'll be successful and you'll be happy, okay? And that's about all I have to say, okay? <laughs> so are there any questions or anything? we got a couple minutes, is all, before you go to lunch. No questions for anybody? Yes, sir. Actually, you know, I probably would get more finance. Okay, if, if I were to start over in college, would I pick a different major? I probably, accounting in those days was kind of the thing to do because you were pretty secure getting a job. And even today, if your degree is accounting, you're most likely going to be able to find a job. But if I had to do it over again, I'd probably have more emphasis in finance and that related kind of, they, they've got programs today like this one, entrepreneurial kinds of programs they didn't have when I was there. And so if I had to start over again, I like the area that I went into because I like to know why the markets go up and down. But um, finance is probably something I would have done. Yes? 
Okay, how did I balance my time through my career? Um, I guess you could ask my wife. I, when, I, when I worked for the, the three places in the middle, I was at work at 5 a.m., so I was home at 3 in the afternoon. But to be honest with you, um, I coached. When I coached, I wanted to be the coach so I could determine when practice was. So we had practice at church, at my church, because I had a gym. People that were on my team liked that. So I tried to control that situation so when I was coaching my kids, if I was the coach, then I had control when we practiced and things like that. At church things, people were good to me there. They knew not to take too much of my time when I was the bishop and things. It's, that's a good question. All I can say to you is that I had a wonderful wife and um, because I was home late afternoon every day into the evening, we were pretty much able to get things done. So, yes? Uh, is it common that, you, that people in that industry will get off at 3 o'clock? Is it common that people in the financial service industry will get off at 3? Well, I was on the West Coast. So see, 3 o'clock is 6 o'clock in New York. And if you're not in investment banking, which goes way into the night, once the markets close, in California, the stock market closes at 1 o'clock. So 2, 3-ish, things are starting to quiet down. I work until 5, 4.30 or 5. But back in those days, once my clients were leaving, I was, I was done. So investment banking and finance, which you're going into, sometimes they might take you a little longer. Okay, But once the markets are closed, if you're in the investment side of it, there's not much you can do. So you're done. Any other questions? You guys, you have so much in front of you, okay? Use the Lord in your life and get, get your education, get your degree. Don't give up. And I wish you the best of luck. Okay. <clears throat>